السلام علیکم خواتین و حضرات ویلکم ٹو دا ورچوئل یونیورسٹی آف پاکستان وی ار ان ٹو لیکچر نمبر ففٹین آف برانڈ مینجمنٹ ایم کے ٹی سکس ٹو فور ان دا پریویس لیکچر وی ور ڈسکسنگ ہاؤ ٹو بلڈ اے برانڈ بیسڈ کسٹمر ماڈل اینڈ ایز یو کین سی فرام دا اسکرین اٹ از دا تھرڈ اسٹیپ آف دا سیکنڈ فیز آف دا اسٹریٹیجک برانڈ مینجمنٹ پروسیس The first being how to develop brand image. The second being how to craft a contract, meaning a brand's contract. And number three, which we are discussing right now, is how to build a brand-based customer model. A building a brand-based customer model is all about understanding beliefs and behaviors of customers. We have created the right image for the brand. We have developed the right contract for the brand. meaning we have put into place all the promises which the brand carries and we are confident that those are going to be delivered. Now we are all set to develop the overall model which is going to enable us sell the brand because that's what the whole thing boils down to. So to be able to sell whatever we have created and the hard work that we have done in terms of the image and the contract and so on and so forth That is now going to be at work for the while we develop this model. You will recall that I talked about three fundamental questions with which this model addresses. The first being how a consumer or a customer chooses one brand over another. The second being how do we compare our brand with competition? Or in other words, how does our brand stand up against the competition? And the third being, what are the possibilities of expansion, extension, and uh, growing of a business? I was talking about uh, the first part which the model addresses, meaning how does a customer choose one brand over another? And you will recall, I talked about very briefly though, three different factors which have got to be understood before we start understanding how the brand-based model addresses the very fundamental question. Those three factors are understanding customers' buying criteria, number two, rating that criteria. The third one is, who are the decision makers? In other words, we've got to understand who makes the decisions or who are the influencers toward that decision-making process. And that is part of the behavior. Going back to factor number one, meaning understanding customer buying criteria, we know that we relate a host of attributes that a brand carries or should carry with the brand itself. And the factors I already have pointed out to you like price, quality, customer service, etc., etc. These are the factors which have been cited uh, in so many uh, research models, meaning there has been a lot of research regarding uh, trying to understand what is the customer with the buying criteria and uh, the factors or the points which I talked about are the ones which have been the result of those various models. One attribute which is implicit Uh, among all those is trust. I did not talk about that earlier. And trust is something which runs across all of the attributes we are talking about. Let us try to understand how. Unless we are convinced that a brand is offering a very good price, we shall not start trusting it. Until the time we are convinced that the brand really is reliable or it is offering us consistent performance, we may not trust the brand. Unless could we assure that the brand does offer a price-value relationship, meaning we get full value for the price that we pay, we're not going to trust the brand. So trust is something which is an essential ingredient of the whole process, meaning of the whole criteria. Until the time we trust the brand, we shall not buy that brand. And therefore, there's a dire need for the brand managers to build that trust. 
and building that trust is delivering all the promises that the product carries. So it is like going back to you know, what we already have learned and it is a process which goes in circle like this. You have to have the right set of promises and promises are translation of features and attributes and the promises have got to be deliverable but once those are delivered you've got to make sure that you have the right the marketing support systems in place you have to have the right members of trade who are selling your brand you have to have the right logistics to support deliveries of your brand so on and so forth so all the factors they come into play and uh, they converge at one point where you deliver and uh, you build trust the next factor toward understanding why or how customers choose the one brand over the other is rating the criteria that we have just discussed. Rating is all about drawing comparisons with competition. Until the time that we really can compare the strengths and weaknesses of our brand with those of the competition, we are going to be in the dark where our brand really stands. So what we do is, while we rate the criteria, we mention a few attributes or a few characteristics that we think are very important to be able to understand the strengths of our brand vis-a-vis -vis competition. We draw a chart and um, or it is like a grid. You can see from the screen that we have six or seven criteria for buying starting with price and going right down to price value relationship and then we have three brands so what you can do is you can compare your brand which maybe is brand a with two for example major players brand b and brand c and uh, then you assign weights you assign weights on a scale of like for example one to five uh, five being excellent and one being poor to all the attributes that uh, could have to be compared in relation to three different brands. And by assigning these weights, you can draw certain conclusions with which brand uh, tops the, the list of attributes and which brand does not. Or could, which are the strengths of one brand and which are uh, not the strengths of another brand. If we concentrate on this rating, we can see that we can, in the first place, look at brand A which we can suppose is ours in terms of all the attributes and we can go right down the vertically right down starting with price down to price value relationship and we can see that we have a weight of three then five or four three five five three different attributes have been given different weights now there is an element of bias here there is no quantitative method the weight you're going to employ in order to assign the weight. Well, if you have, so much the better. But uh, this is just for the sake of understanding that we assign weights to different attributes that we uh, relate with our brand. We relate the same attributes to brand B and then to brand C. And going from top down, we can relate these weights with the attributes and then see where all these three brands stand. We can also draw another comparison which is horizontal and we can compare brand A, B and C in terms of pricing. If you take a look at uh, the price line which is the top row, uh, the brand A is 3, B is 4 and C is again 3. What does that mean? Well, what that means is the weight of 3 represents pricing on a little higher side. And that is why you have not assigned a very heavy weight. In case of brand B, you have assigned a weight of 4, which means the price is a little better. And again, in terms of brand C, the weight is 3, so which can be uh, translated into similarity of pricing patterns between brand A and brand C. So in other words, by assigning these weights, you can draw comparisons which are vertical and comparisons which are horizontal. The vertical comparisons mean that you compare your own brand or one brand against its own attributes 
and horizontal comparisons with the mean that you compare that one attribute in relation to all the brands that you are comparing. This is a very interesting uh, uh, rating. What I may suggest to you all is, why don't you come up with um, uh, this kind of a grid, a rating comparison uh, by considering uh, three different brands of any, uh, within any category, uh, toothpaste for example, the biscuits for another example, or maybe any other product category, and uh, assign weights to different attributes which you think are very essential uh, in relation to those three brands or in, in relation to your own beliefs. Because it is all about your needs which are to be fulfilled and if you are the customer, you should know uh, what are the elements of the criteria which you bring into play while you make a decision to buy a certain brand. Uh, this can be a very, very interesting and educative exercise uh, and uh, I'm, I'm sure you're going to enjoy that. This is the, one of the techniques that you can um, like, bring into play in order to compare the, your brand with uh, uh, other major competitors uh, in order to gauge the strengths and weaknesses uh, of uh, the brands under comparison. The fact remains that determining how consumers choose is much more difficult than we may think. Now, this is not to say that we should not carry out the kind of comparison which I just talked about. What I'm talking about here is that behavior of consumers is a very complex thing. It is much less difficult or rather easy to measure the buying patterns of consumers, meaning how many times in a week, for example, they buy, what are the quantities they buy in a week or in a month and so on and so forth. But getting into the minds of consumers in terms of their psychology toward making decisions how they buy is very difficult. This is what marketing researchers and psychologists have concluded. Since it is a question of dealing with the human mind, we do not really have the right answers as to how they buy. Researchers go to the extent of saying that you ask questions, beautifully built questions to respondents. They come up with certain answers and you like those answers because you think the responses are very logical. But they also go on to say that those responses do not mean much. Why does that way? It's not the topic of discussion today, but the fact remains it is quite very difficult to determine the actual behavior of consumers. How they develop preferences, how they become brand loyal. What is important here is that we should be able to sell our brand. And whatever efforts that we are exerting must lead us toward attainment of one goal, and that is that we should be able to sell. And toward that, market research plays a very important role, and it must carry on, despite the fact that understanding consumer behavior is very difficult the research must go on. It still gives us a lot of leads, very interesting insights of enormous richness on the basis of which we make our decisions and our decisions get a lot of confidence because of the findings which we've had through the research. Having said that, let us now talk about a few factors which uh, researchers have concluded uh, form uh, the brand perception. There seems to be the total consensus among uh, the marketing researchers and all, all the experts who really matter that uh, consumers have a set of perceptions with which I'm going to discuss uh, the one by one, uh, which really come into play uh, while they behave the way they do. Now, when I talk about these perceptions with which marketing experts say they should form the basis of our understanding toward 
knowing how consumers behave. Uh, let me say it once again, that the comparisons that we draw or the market research that we carry out in order to look the way strengths and weaknesses of our brands in relation to others that must go on. I mean, the process must never stop. And the attributes and the, the weights that we assign to those attributes and the relationships that we draw here and there uh, among all the, uh, the models that I've been dis discussing about uh, that must go on. These brand perceptions or these perceptions uh, on part of the customers uh, toward uh, their branding decisions are some of the fundamentals with which all the marketing people, uh, the brand managers in particular, uh, they must be aware of before they carry out the kind of market research and the comparisons that I talked about. Yani wo kaam jo aap kar rahe hain, marketing research or comparisons se draw kar rahe hain, wo bilkul nahi rukna chahiye. Iske saath hi saath, ye chand aise bunyadi findings hain, jin ka ilm hume agar ho, to wo yakinan unka fayda hoga in order to understand uh, the comparisons that we draw and in order to um, carry out um, all the analysis that we are carrying out with the help of uh, the, our research models. Well, let us talk about um, the perceptions which uh, have come to um, be known as uh, the fundamental perceptions which brand managers must not lose uh, the sight of uh, while they are carrying out their own studies or their own research. The foremost the perception is that people perceive the brand as a whole. They do not really form their impressions and the beliefs uh, analytically on the basis of separate pieces. So what does that mean? Uh, what, what that means is that uh, the attributes which they consider before they make up the mind to go for a certain brand, they do not really go through a complicated process of all these single attributes one by one. They form an impression as a whole. Now, when they form their impression about the brand as a whole, that in itself is a process. And I would say that even if they arrive at a decision in the mind, subconsciously, the individual or separate pieces, meaning separate attributes, they do come into play. You're used to brand and you know it carries good price and it offers a very good price value relationship. It is consistent in performance and it is a good quality brand. So all those factors, when they are sitting at the back of your mind, it is those factors which are playing all the time in your subconscious and lead you toward making an impression as a whole. So this is a process, you know, which is very holistic in nature. Holistic, H-O-L-I-S-T-I-C, which means that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Meaning if you have five parts and you assign one number to each, the aggregate is five, but the impact of that is much greater than five. That is what the holistic approach means. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. But what really is important here is that the separate pieces which we are talking about and which we talked about earlier do have their own importance. We cannot assume or we cannot state with confidence at all that since consumers have a tendency to develop a concept of the brand as a whole and therefore we should not get into comparisons, we should not uh, look into the attributes one by one and we should not get into uh, weighing the buying criteria. I hope it makes the whole concept very clear now because I was talking about on the one hand the importance of carrying out comparisons on the basis of the criteria which you have determined on the other, I was also talking about the market researchers or psychologists saying that it is quite very difficult to understand what in actuality is the behavior on part of the customer while they make the decisions to buy certain brands. 
And toward that, they say there are certain fundamental perceptions relating brands which we should understand, rather we must understand. And these put together along with the market research and the comparisons that you have drawn gives you very good leads. We have talked about the first perception. Let's now move on to the second one. Psychologists say that perception is selective. Not all the information that you receive in the marketplace, in one way or the other, through word of mouth, through advertising, through observation, through talking with people, through any means of communication or observation, is not stored in 100%. The process is very selective. And when we say selective, what it means is that the process goes through a filtering. There are certain elements of information or there are certain informations that we save and there are certain parts of information that we forget and that stands rejected. And if that is the case, the behavior of customers has got to be based on those selections. What those selections are, how those are formed, that's part of psychology. But nevertheless, we must try to understand what is the marketing part that is absolutely essential for us to understand. And I would revert back to the comparisons and the research models that we have at work. Because when we put all those together, we can draw some very interesting findings and also relate those to the brand perception number two, which says perception is selective. I think why I say that we can draw relationships between models, I can substantiate this with the help of a concept that you already know. If you try to be at the pinnacle of the value pyramid, even if you're not there, you are one of the players who occupy top slot of the value pyramid. I mean, there has to be one to seek the which is at the pinnacle and the remaining are around the leader. You all are very important, all major players. I think even if the process is very much subject to selection, the chances are those few of you will be retained in the mind of the consumer and those who are not there may be forgotten. So that is the implication. The third perception is, or the rule is, that consumer's perception is the reality. This also has become very, very proverbial. Whatever consumers perceive is very important. And whatever they perceive is the basis of their beliefs. We cannot say that beliefs of consumers are wrong only because their beliefs do not have a compatibility with what we expect. Meaning, if we expect our customers to behave in a certain way, or if we expect them to have certain beliefs because we have identified a certain need and we think or we should expect that they must follow a certain behavior in order to satisfy their need, that may not be the case. To give you one example, we may be selling one of the, the best quality sandwiches in the world. But if the delivery person has a very unhygienic upkeep, what is going to be the reaction or what is going to be the perception formed at the customer end? The customer is going to think to himself or to herself, this is not a good company, this is not a quality product. And despite the fact that they make very tall claims about being very hygienic in terms of their processes, they really are not. So a negative perception is formed, which will lead to a negative behavior. So this is what really is meant by consumer's perception. We have to have all the elements and all the factors that come into play in delivering all the promises in place. Unless could we have all those in place, we may lead our customers into gray areas. 
where negative behavior will be formed on their part. Let us now take a look at um, the next perception which uh, consumers generally have. It is a variety of factors which come into play while customers gauge different brands. And this has a very close relationship with the concept that I discussed earlier relating similarities among different brands. You will recall when I talked about uh, the brand managers and marketing people getting into very similar kind of marketing research models because of uh, the needs which are homogeneous in the marketplace, uh, because of the technologies which are very homogeneous, uh, because of um, the, um, the marketing setups, because of the marketing support systems, with all those factors could have so much similarities that all of us carry out marketing research in a way that we all end up with findings which are very similar. And based on that, we develop products which again are very similar. Look at the cars, for example. You know, we tend to say as lay people that since, you know, this is the fad or this is the fashion, this is something in vogue, therefore others have to follow. Yeah, that has some logic to it, no question about that, but uh, the fact of the matter is that it is a result of the similarities that we have in the marketplace in relation to all the factors that are talked about. So the customers could have their own ways to judge brands that are similar. So this is the one thing that we have to keep in mind before we move ahead with our own research models, meaning a variety of factors come into play while customers judge different brands in the market, meaning they weigh one brand against the other. And that gives us an understanding of how to behave. Let us now move on to the next perception, which the psychologists call the magical number seven, plus minus two. What does that mean? Well, that means that human mind has a limited capacity to save information or to store information. And they say that we do not really have a capacity higher than storing just about seven items of similar nature. Let us now refer to two different situations of low involvement and high involvement when it comes to the purchasing process. In terms of low involvement situations in which we buy items of daily use or all items falling under FMCGs, fast moving consumer goods. I told you people or customers do not generally involve themselves in a very complex or in a complex process at all before they make the decision to buy a certain brand. And in other situations, which are high involvement situations, they may involve themselves a little bit in terms of gathering information before they go to the market, analyzing that, and then going for the purchase. Having had an understanding of that, it again becomes very significant that the limited information that customers have in relation to one product category, we've got to be a part of that in his mind or her mind. I think it goes without saying that because of that limitation, we've got to be the one of the players if not the leading player in the category, one of the major players that does exist in the minds of the customers. To give you the one example from uh, market research studies, there are just about 20 to 25 percent of uh, the customers who go to the supermarket and do not waste any time before they buy a product, meaning they do not get involved into any kind of thought process, apparently, or deliberations before 
they buy things. About 20 to 25 percent. Now, this 25 percent, supposing it is 25, this 25 percent could be those uh, loyal customers who are in the vicinity of 20 percent and who are responsible for like 80 you know, percent of total sales of one brand. You can draw a correlation between these two factors. And then there is another finding that there are about 50 to 55 percent of customers who take about seven to eight seconds before the buyer brand. That is just about it. So in other words, there's a good percentage of the total market, meaning about 70, 75 percent, meaning three-fourth, that is not really involved in a lengthy process of making decisions for buying. And it is one of those fundamentals that we have to keep in mind. And I think this can be very convincing, convincingly related with the models that we've been trying to develop. Again, we've got to be one of those few who are the chosen ones or who are the privileged ones in their minds. That's the finding of this perception, I would say. Another perception which forms this uh, list of, uh, of fundamentals is that um, the brand has a personality. And that is something all brand managers must keep in the mind. This might sound like very familiar and might sound like something which may not be needed for discussion here. But this also has to be related to the psychological process that goes on in the minds toward the behavior they show. Consumers can imagine brands that have very distinct personalities with characteristics consumers can describe. We are saying here that consumers conjure up certain images in their minds relating different brands and the images that they have in the minds relate to those brands which have very strong personalities or distinct personalities. And it is very obvious that brands that have strong identity are going to be the ones with good personalities. So in other words, the stronger the brand identity, the stronger is the relationship between the brand and the customer. And the customers can also, in that case, describe various characteristics of that brand. Although this is a universal perception which has to be kept in mind, but it does call upon the need for us to have our findings ready. And it makes important for us that we do develop features and attributes relating our brands that are very distinct because it is those features and attributes which translate into benefits and are the ones that give brands very strong personalities and strong personalities are remembered. So here again I'm trying to relate these general perceptions with the need to have these sort of comparisons and the small research models that I've been talking about so far. Right back from the images, how to develop the brand image, and then how to develop a brand's contract, and then on to creating a brand-based model. So the need to carry out our own research cannot be undermined by the general perceptions that psychologists have presented us with. I would say that these perceptions are the supplements they're going to supplement our findings. They're going to give us confidence about the findings that we're going to have through our research processes. Therefore, there should be no confusion between whether to keep these perceptions or to go for the research models that we've been discussing in all the lectures that we've had so far.
I think that's clear. All right. So we can conclude that consumers have a large amount of information which they get from various sources. Like I said, word of mouth, advertising, their experiences, their observations, advertising, retailers, talking with friends, peers, colleagues, relatives, so on and so forth. I mean, the list goes on. With a lot of information which they receive, but there's a limitation to what they can save, what they can store. The remaining information goes out the mind. And what is important here is you should not be the one to go out of the mind. You must be the one of those retained in the minds of the customers. That's the implication. Now, having said that, another implication which uh, bears extra significance, I would say, that is, in the markets which are so crowded, in the markets which are so complex in terms of all the factors that we have discussed about, because of the competitive nature and because of the selective nature of the process up here, the brand message must be simple and focused. That is another implication that has to be kept in mind in order to be a part of those brands that occupy that limited memory or that limited part of the human mind. Because if we can get there, we have laid the foundation for good positioning of the brand, which is a topic of discussion in the next lecture. And if, if you have laid the right foundation for the right positioning of the brand, there's no way that our strategies are not going to be the right ones. They're bound to be the right ones. And by keeping the messages simple and focused, we keep the beliefs and the behavior of the customers pretty much straightforward. If the message is not simple, the customer is going to be confused. This factor is talked about already. If the message is not focused, it again is going to cause confusion in the customer's mind. The message can be simple not only through communication, but also through the personality of the brand. Communication, like you will recall, is not only verbal, it can also be non-verbal. And it is the non-verbal part of communication which you see on the package. You go to the supermarket, you take a look at a brand, it looks into your eyes and tells you to what extent the brand is serious, reliable, appealing, attractive, maybe satisfying also. And if you already have some knowledge about that, I mean prior knowledge, the decision is going to be straightforward. So that's the implication of all the perceptions that we have discussed. Let us now move on to the third factor, which is the part of the first question, which brand-based model addresses, meaning how do customers choose one brand over the other? We are still talking about that. And it is the third factor which addresses that question. And that is, who makes the decisions, meaning the buying decisions? Now, this is a factor of the which is going to facilitate our understanding toward buying behavior. When something is sold in the market, it is not always that the decision that was taken by the customer to buy that particular brand was his or her sole decision. There could be other influencers within the family. I can give you the example of edible oil. When the housewife buys one particular brand of edible oil, it could very well be the decision, the joint decision of the family, taking into account so many different variables. The health factor, 
being the prime factor. And you know what I mean. We talk about uh, a consumer durable electronics, for example. It could very well be that the couple of the house may have to listen to the wishes of their children before they buy that. The examples in this regard could be endless, and I will leave that to your thinking. What is important here is the brand managers must make all those influencers part of the marketing decisions that they make toward the brand. In order to qualify the statement that I've made, I will give you the example of a commercial for edible oil or maybe for tea, for example, that shows the whole family. The use of that particular brand makes the whole family happy. And it presents the family with a very pleasing experience. That is why brand managers choose to show all the family members in that kind of a commercial because they know that the decision is not taken by one of the family members. The decision could be a joint decision. And therefore, the influencers have got to be approached and appealed. Having talked about this factor, our discussion regarding the three factors that address the fundamental question, how do consumers buy one brand over the other, is complete. And that now takes us on to the next question. How does your brand stand up against the competition? This again sounds familiar. Now here, we're not going to carry out uh, the kind of comparisons that I've been talking about earlier. It is not a repetition. This is a situation in which you've got to understand from the customer's perspective, of course, the strengths and weaknesses as understood by the customers. And strengths and weaknesses relating not only to your brand, but to all the competitive brands. And this, in a way, is an extension of uh, the, uh, the comparison that you carried out while uh, you were rating the, the buying criteria. But what is different here is that you've got to refer to all the players of the industry and you've got to take a very hard look at the whole category in which different players are playing their part in so many different meaningful ways. In order to explain this concept in uh, a little detail, uh, let me give you the example of uh, the cola industry. Uh, one, of, one of the cola manufacturers found out through the market research that um, the immediate competition the company was facing was not from uh, the immediate rival, meaning another cola manufacturer. Rather, it was from plain water. So plain water that you buy in the market and you see in terms of so many different brands, also offers stiff competition to cola drinks, in other words. So this is what I meant by comparing uh, traditional and kind of non-traditional competitors with the brands that you have. So you, know, you have to look at the whole market, or meaning the whole category, from the customer's point of view, the way customers can look at your competitors, the way customers perceive with who your competitors are. This cola company is found out through the help of customers by initiating marketing research that it was the plain water which was giving them stiff competition. And the fact of the matter is that they devised their strategy not toward their immediate cola rival. They devised a marketing strategy which was meant to win over those customers who preferred water to the cola drinks. Not caring that the overall business which is going to be generated or which is going to be won over from the other category, meaning across the category lines, is going to come not only to this cola drink, but may also go to other cola drinks. 
the company still did go ahead. Now, this is the where discussion of uh, expanding the category comes in, and at the moment it is not uh, the objective to discuss that. But uh, since I've touched upon that, uh, let me tell you, there are certain situations in which leading in the players they get into campaigns which are the beneficial for, for the whole category, and all the players of the category benefit. And uh, when that happens, the leading player who initiated that kind of a campaign does not mind that as long as uh, the leading player's business uh, gets the major part of the uh, incremental business. It does happen. Another example which I can give you is uh, the, that you have to look at uh, the category uh, from the customer's point of view the, in terms of strengths and weaknesses and in terms of uh, knowing the, who your real competitors are. Safety matches versus disposable lighters. Now a company that is manufacturing matches may not think that they are facing competition from disposable lighters also. Because they may, they may be thinking all the time that that is a different category or maybe that is an extension of this category but you know those are different kind of customers because they have different kinds of behavior. When you carry out market research which is focused on those who are the users of matches they might give you certain insights through the answers, responses with startling revelations and you might start thinking to yourselves that we have been making a mistake and disposable lighters is not only an extension of this category, this is very much part of this category and we just cannot ignore that while we think of uh, different marketing strategies as to how to create more sales because they may be making dent into the sales of safety matches. So this is, uh, uh, th these, these are the two examples uh, which really explain the concept of how uh, you uh, compare your brand against competition or how you look at your brand the way it stacks up or stands up against competition from customer's perspective as to how does customer think who your competitors are. It is not what you think. You have to look at it from the customer's perspective, who your competitors are and what are the strengths and weaknesses as understood and envisioned by the customers. And for that, like I said earlier, uh, you have to have the very good uh, industry analysis which uh, was part of the overall uh, uh, the business management uh, long-term plan. Uh, you will recall that. And uh, once you have that kind of insight into the industry, of course, it goes without saying, it gives you another lead to position your brand uh, better into the minds of the customers. The uh, next uh, the question, um, which um, the model addresses is um, the opportunities for brand growth and expansion. The third question which the model addresses is about uh, the market opportunities and further growth. How we can identify those opportunities so that we can further grow, we can expand within the category or we can expand ex across the category that is going to be the topic of uh, discussion in the next lecture in Allah Hafiz until then.